Welcome to the show that will keep you from falling behind during the week. With your hostesses with no ghostesses, Jackie and Belinda here for the Friday Catch-Up on the Paracross Radio Network. Hey, welcome to another week of Friday Catch-Up, everyone. Hi, Jackie. Hello. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Doctor Who. Doctor Who's finished. I know. Uh, I'm not you happy. have to wait till Christmas. Uh, uh. Anyway, let's play the tune and then we'll talk. Okay. Okay, I spent a lot of this episode slapping my leg going, oh my god. <laughs> Can you guess so what app? <laughs> <sighs> well, uh, do you know which bits I was going, oh my god, to? Uh, if I could take a, well, no, you didn't say you were hiding behind the couch, so mm. otherwise, otherwise blah, blah, blah. so then it's not the Statue of Liberty. It was, actually. Really? Yep. Because, you know, it's just like, you get the close-up view of the person, and all you see is, like, this tongue and the teeth and the lip. And I'm like, oh, my God. And Daryl's like, what? I'm going, Statue of Liberty. He goes, bullshit. I said, wait. And they did it, like, two seconds later. <laughs> and he's like, holy shit. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> and Monica's just, rolling, awesome. Monica's just, like, rolling her eyes. She's just like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and then the cherubs, like, sorry if you, none of you watch this, go and watch it. You'll know exactly what we're talking about. Spoiler alert, slightly late. Um, <laughs> it was like, Egh. I don't think I'm going to be able to listen to children's giggles quite the same way ever again. Yeah, no. <laughs> Those things will now creep me out. It's... It's sort of like the Bride of Chucky. You know how everyone watched that and then their toys automatically got ejected from their room? Yeah. That's probably what I'm going to be like. I'm just glad that Australia is so disgusting with their culture that there are, like, no statues. Oh, we have plenty of statues. Well, not necessarily here, but every once in a while you can go into um, certain graveyards and you'll see uh, statues and all this, and some of them are of children, which makes it even creepier. And, mm. um, yeah. And <sighs> we even get the occasional one in the graveyards here where, where their hands are actually over their eyes, like they're crying. And it's like, mm-hmm. I haven't been to a cemetery since I've met the Weeping Angels. I probably won't. I remember um, we <clears throat> we used to pass this one graveyard. It had a giant, like, um, a really tall statue, like you could see it from the road, of Jesus, and with his hands outstretched, you know, typical Jesus pose. Mm-hmm. And you know, as you're driving, you know, before Doctor Who, it's like, oh, it's nice, it's a statue. Now it's then, just like, <gasps> <laughs> then you see Doctor Who, it's like, Jesus is gonna get me. Oh God. <laughs> oh God. It's like, no, wrong one. <laughs> and um. <laughs> Oh my god, no. See, the only problem that I had with it, with, mm. um, oh, by the way, in case you haven't figured out by this point, we're talking about the Angels Take Manhattan, which was the Little... farewell to Amy and Rory. <sighs> yeah. Did you cry? No. Really? Really, I didn't. I'm sitting there going, just get on with it. I figured you out of everyone would cry. No. And hmm. you know what my beautiful, kind-hearted daughter said at the end of it? What? I didn't like Rory anyway. <laughs> I like Rory. He was kind of the comic relief. apart from, He really was. You know, he was kind of cool. But I wish they had put more importance on Rory rather than on Amy. But then it would seem like a bromance... And then we'd be all asking if Doctor Who was gay. And then there'd be that whole argument and it's just easier to make 
the companion female? Well, I mean, the thing is, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in the dark depths of the internet, there's already Slash. <laughs> I know, but still. Doctor and Rory, Doctor and the Master. I've read some very interesting ones. It's <sighs> okay. And is you know, going, the next Fifty Shades of Grey can be written better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. So, anyway, I watched that program on the TV. So, we got to see it in the big thing, you know, because I'm like, well, Statue of Liberty looking itty bitty on my laptop screen, probably not going to give the same impact as the big rah moment. Yeah, especially and, with the uh, Statue of Liberty. Yeah, so... I watched it. I'm like, eh, okay. Uh, went to my writers' meeting on Sunday, which is yesterday, which is wibbly wobbly timey wimey, because this will be aired on Saturday for me, Friday for yep. you, and yep. Anyway, um, and they're all going, that just can't happen. There is no way that that is even plausible. I'm like, why? They're like, the Statue of Liberty is always being looked at. At any moment of any given day, any given week, month, year, whatever, there is always someone looking at the Statue of Liberty. That's true. And they also said, and what's the dealio with, like, the noise? No other weeping angels, apart from the cherubs, make any noise. So it's I like, don't know, but yeah, that was huh. one of the main problems I had with it, was how did no one notice the Statue of Liberty just got up, walked through the harbor and no one noticed in Manhattan? <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't just a little noise because everyone's like, what's that noise? What's that noise? It sounded like thunder. Oh my god. I'm like, how many other people in Manhattan would have gone hey, what's that noise? And looked out their windows. Then she would be able to move. Exactly. So it's like... And- can't happen. Implausible, completely bogus. I call BS. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I liked it. I really did like that episode. But the only problem I had was, okay, they're talking about um, once you see it or once you read it, it's set in stone. Okay, if that's the case, then every little piece of Doctor Who that's played for 50 years shouldn't have happened. Uh, I don't know. That makes my brain hurt. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. You look at it uh, like in the times that we, they've gone back in history. Mm-hmm. And they've changed you know, little bits and pieces of history around, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Everyone has read history books. Everyone in the world knows at least one piece of history that yeah. they've played on that show. Mm-hmm. Okay, so how can they go back and change it? It's just, there's little things like that, and, you know, um, hello, the, like, very first episode of Series 6 saw the Doctor dying, and that didn't work out. Mm-hmm. So, obviously not. Hmm. I don't know. It's all wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey, as it always should be. But, yeah. There's always that paradox... And I wouldn't mind a paradox, because they're kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You I worked know. hard for that one. Uh, well, yeah, a little bit. Um, uh, I don't know. You know, it just... In a way, I'm, like, really proud that they did Rory and Amy... You know, they did them justice with writing them out, you know, they did it in a reasonably respectful way, you know, it was romantic, which they had to do because, you know, you don't get a soldier waiting around for God knows how long to be with his wife, you know, without and then, romance yeah. there, and, and yeah. Um, everyone at the writers meeting was like, oh, it was so sad, I'm like, but were you sad for Rory and Amy, or were you sad for River? And they're like, Rory and Amy, I said, well, actually, I was sad for River. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why? I said, well, that's her mum and dad. So she's actually seeing the demise of her mum and dad. Which, and they're like, technically oh. speaking, that means she shouldn't even exist. 
I know. But, you know, if I was Amy and I was watching River interact with the Doctor, he would have had his butt kicked so many times. Mm -hmm. Oh, my stars. (laughs) Like, don't speak to my daughter that way. (laughs) There were so, so many plot holes in this one, though. I mean, all in all, if you look at it just overall, it was a great episode. But then you sit there and you start analyzing and picking it apart, and you're like, wait a minute. Like... Um, for example, if River can go back and see Amy and Rory, why can't the Doctor? Because he's in a big thingy and she's got the little doohickey on her wrist, which is so like a, they've shown a they've shown that traffic. <laughs> they've shown that they've shown that three people can travel by vortex manipulator before. It's not comfortable. It's not fantastic, but it they can do there. it. It gets you there. And the one thing that I didn't like is, in a way, they kind of romanticized suicide. Mm, yeah, and that's kind of bad, considering this is Mental Health Week. So, <laughs> yeah, not exactly the best timing in the world. Not really, no. But, I mean, I don't know. Other than that, I really liked it. Yep. So, eh, I'd probably give it about a 7. But, you know, it's cool. I mean, it was less gut-wrenching than when Rose left. That one really got me. You would. I know. But, you know, I think the shippers had a bit of fun with that one. So, (laughs) shippers are people who concentrate mostly on relationships in TV, books, etc. Just in case you didn't know. So, yeah. Yay! The shippers had fun with Rose Tyler. Tyler. Mm hmm. Uh, alrighty. So, now should we talk about Bathurst or should we talk about books? Uh, I think we need to talk about Bathurst. Since that one probably will be quick because you and I have seen the same amount of race. And since I went to my writers' meeting, I saw one lap out of 160 Yay. something. <laughs> I saw one lap. Yay! Which is fine with me, really, but you know, I like to watch the whole race. And my daughter is now fired. I, I set her you. up all week. I'm like, look, I need to go to my writers' meeting on Sunday. Bathurst is on. There must always be someone there to make sure that your father doesn't go overboard. And she's like, what? I said, he's a Ford fan. He's a bit of a worry. She's like, huh? I said, I'm going to loan you one of my Holden shirts. And your job for the day is every time he goes, yay, Ford, is to go, mm-mm, yay, Holden. So, <laughs> and I ring him up, like, after the meeting. And he goes, oh, she's not even here. I'm like... What? He goes, oh, she's over at a friend's house. I'm like, oh, I loaned her my shirt. Dude, she's fired. So, yes. (laughs) Not a happy bunny. So I told her as such, and she's like, so? I'm like, "Ah." Don't you understand, child? Obviously not. Maybe she's not yours. Maybe she was switched at birth. <laughs> well, I- I've quite often wondered, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know too many people that enjoy football as much as she does. So, yeah. Hmm. hmm. Things to ponder. But the good news is, because we have seen the exact same amount, that means I... Keep my title of Adopted Australian. Yay! Yay! So, yeah, for those of you that didn't know, if you want to become an Adopted Australian, all you have to do is watch that. Yes. Ta-da! <laughs> Preferably a whole race, but since the time difference is a bit of a bugger, you know, a couple of laps will do. Yeah. And you can always, you know, look it up on, like, YouTube. Yes, because that's where my lap came from for you. Yay! Yay! 
So, anyone who didn't know, Holden won. Yay! Ford Yay. came second. I have no idea who came third. I really don't care. Because <laughs> apparently third was, like, so far back. So, yep. Uh, mm. uh, Jamie Wincup won in the Vodafone car. Not Wanker, which is what I heard. No, Wincup. So, for those of you uh, Americans with, you know, the funny ears and stuff, if you happen to go and watch it on YouTube, he's not saying wanker, which is what I thought. No, no, win cup. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he basically won it on the smell of an oily rag. He was that low on fuel. So like, There's a joke cool. I could make, and it would be just really horrible, so I'm not going to do it. Oh, go on. Maybe he had gas, and it was the fumes of that that kept him going. Well, it wouldn't be the first time. I mean, there was a race previously, like, I think it was in the 90s, where the guy literally ran out of fuel, like, 10 meters. I don't know what that is in feet, but it was pretty damn close to the final flag. And he got out of his car, and he was pushing that car up a hill to get it across the line. And then they said, no, you actually need to be in the car to win. Oh, I would have given it to him. Yeah. Then there was 1992, where there was that many accidents that they actually red flagged it. So when they red flag it, it goes to the previous lap and who was leading that lap as to who wins. And there was a lot of cranky people because it was a Holden that won then too. At least I think mm -hmm. it was. So, yeah, it didn't go down real well. <laughs> no, I could see that. So it was the 50 years of Bathurst this year. So mm. half a century of running around a really scary track. Uh, if any of you have the desire to go on YouTube... Can't remember what was what the name of the NASCAR guy's name was, um, but yeah, they stuck a NASCAR guy in a V8, an Australian V8, and they ran him around Bathurst, and he was praying for Jesus. <laughs> it scared him so badly. I'm like, yeah, you know, you just got to watch out for the left hand turn, mate. Same as NASCAR. <laughs> No, well, it, the thing is, with NASCAR, awesome. you pretty much have just this one huge oval, and that's pretty much it, and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Bit of a Then yawn. you go and look at that track, and it's like, whoa! And then you go and look at, like, say, like the Grand Prix mm -hmm. uh, in, like, Monaco, and it's oh, like, yeah. what the crap? Americans don't know what to do with that. It's like, there are turns and, and loops and things. What? This isn't racing. <laughs> and chicanes and dippers and things like that. It's like, ooh, mm -hmm. exciting. And then they look at the form, like at the at the cars, and they're like, "Those aren't cars. Those are go karts." No, they're like highly tuned, precision vehicles. They're that's, fantastic. That's really what they are, and quite a lot of the technology from those actually end up in like your standard street cars. Mm -hmm. So, BMW, Mercedes, yes. things like that. They they go off of those types of cars. So if you happen to be driving, well, none of our listeners, I don't think. But <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe you one of them will win one the day blue. own one, <laughs> or borrow one, test drive one. There we go. That's the only chance I think go. we've all got. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you happen to sniff one very closely, or you know, take it for a drive for a test drive or whatever. You have those cars to thank for that. Yes, so that technology does go to good use eventually. Yes. Um, what else? What? Oh, yes, next year, it's not just Ford and Holden, it'll be Nissan, or Nissan, whatever you guys call it. I have no Nissan. idea. Nissan? Nissan, oh my God. Nissan, come <laughs> on. Jesus Christ. And Mercedes will be joining the crew, so 
Hopefully we'll have enough people in the household that we will have a four-way n uh fest. So, <laughs> you know, it'll be cool. It'll be lots of fun, and it will mean that Ford and Holden have to pick up their game. Definitely. Which can never be know, a bad thing. Holden's probably getting tired of just whooping the crap out of Ford. Well, considering Ford in the U.S. was sort of up crap creep without a paddle in a barbed wire canoe earlier on in the last few years, um, we don't have as many Ford teams. So it's sort of like you look through the top ten, it's like Holden, 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 Holden. Oh, there's a Ford. Holden, 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 Holden. <laughs> so, you know, it, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens. One of the Brisbane-based teams, Stone Brothers Racing, is actually switching to Mercedes. So, I might actually see my husband in something other than blue. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Maybe he'll switch to silver. Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. Should we move on to books? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and since you've probably read more books than me, you can go first. Well, okay. You remember the book that you bought me on Friday? <laughs> Yeah. I finished it on Friday. <laughs> you were supposed to be going to bed. Oh, my goodness. It actually only took me about six hours. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Reading maniac. <laughs> well, there's your birthday present. You know, I hope you're happy. <laughs> I was. Oh, my God. I, <laughs> this, oh, I started reading it and I was thinking, yeah, I always go into reading a book thinking that it's not going to be good. That way I can be pleasantly surprised at the end of it. Okay. So I pick up this book uh, about an hour after we aired the show. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. So it was about five, six o'clock maybe when I started reading. Mm -hmm. I put it down at about 10.30. I picked it up again about... 3.30 in the morning, I put it down at, I finished it at 4.30 in the morning so technically speaking, I finished it on Saturday but mm. in the it was a fantastic book of Sunday. so it was good, was it? it is um, the second book in the Elemental Mystery series, unfortunately it is not for free, though I highly, highly, highly recommend it if you have um, a Kindle e-reader I highly recommend it because it's three ninety nine, something like that, for the electronic or the digital price. So mm -hmm. that's a bargain for these books. I I literally cannot believe they are that cheap. And when I bought it for you, they sort of like had the the option there of what date I wanted to send it to. You. I think they need also the option of how much to send you, because. <laughs> If I was, like, really, really mean, and you know that I am, <laughs> I'd send you, like, the first 15 pages and then make you wait till your birthday. <laughs> and you'd be I, like, damn it, bitch. <laughs> I literally would have killed you. <laughs> that would be so much fun. They need to do that. <laughs> but the murder rate would go way up. Oh, well, you know, need a bit of chlorine in the gene pool anyway. As long as it's not be me being killed, I really don't care. So. <laughs> I'm sure you would work your way around to the kill list eventually. You're oh, just probably. that type of person. You know, I can't, can't miss a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was Elizabeth Hunt, wasn't it? Hunter. Hunter. There we go. Yeah. Keep forgetting to put the oh. ER on the end. Yeah, so I'm at the I'm at the mercy of my uh, wish list now to get book three and four. <laughs> now, if I'm not mistaken, today, the day that we are playing this, is actually your birthday, is it not? Uh, actually, t technically tomorrow, which is the day after we record, Saturday. Well, you know what? That's good enough for me because it's Saturday here. So guess what? the chair, boys. We got another bucket kicker. Happy birthday, my old friend. It seems this horror show will never end. And in your moment's your last breath. Here is to another day closer to death. Okay, you get
get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. You, have... you got me. I wasn't expecting that. I know. Fantastic, isn't it? Now i just got to hope that Audacity doesn't eat the show because that's just oh, going to sound all kinds of mixed up if I have to stick it back together and get it wrong. <laughs> so, poor old Voltaire. We'll never sound the same again. <laughs> the remix. Yeah, the remix. A la Belinda. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so that was all you read this week? I started on the book I talked about last week. Mm-hmm. And I, I unfortunately I passed out in the middle of it because I started it like four o'clock in the morning. Which is always a great way to start your book. Like, Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Not saying that it was boring. It was just I was tired. <laughs> yes. As most people are at that era of the morning. Yes. Hmm. Um, okay, so I've been reading Stella Remington's The Geneva Trap, and that one's just basically about, you know, espionage and stuff like that. Uh, Stella Remington has her claim to fame because she knows her shit. She actually worked for MI5, I think it was, or something like that, in England, and she left them, so now she's writing crime novels that are based around political espionage um, international crime, stuff like that. A lot of European nations get included into it. Uh, I am 217 pages in of 328, so I'm, I'm nearly done. But Yay! It's not too bad, actually. I mean, my biggest concern when starting it was that this is not the first book that Stella Remington has written with these characters. So I was a little bit concerned that I'd feel like I'm jumping in the deep end and have no idea about anything. But I was assured that, no, each one can be a standalone book. And they're right, so I'm happy about that. Uh, I got my review books on Tuesday last week. So I have House at the End of the Street, which is a... A uh, film adaption because it says at the top of the book it says now a major motion picture. I was just thinking that yeah I'd heard that that's a scary book or movie. Yeah and um you know Marianne's like I know you don't really like the scary stuff but here give this a try I'm like eh. yay. <laughs> um so there's someone named Carrie Ann in it. I'm not reading the blurb because I don't want to scare myself into not reading it. Um, I have Barry Maitland's All My Enemies, and it was uh, a get-reading book, which is like a big Australian thing. Basically, they claim it's a book you can't put down. Well, guess what? There we go. Um, (laughs) I don't know where the audio just carried, but I just threw it down. Anyway, uh, I have been assured this one's really good. Uh, Yep. Cool. That one's... (laughs) actually the next one that I'm going to be reading. Uh, I also got Tara Moss uh, Assassin. So Tara Moss is that fantastic woman that I keep raving about. She's fantastic. Uh, The other books in that series are Fetish, Split, Covet, Hit and Siren. Uh, Yep. Ex-model, Canadian, Australian. Fantastic lady. Beautiful heart, beautiful soul. I love her writing, even though I've never read it, but, you know, everybody raves, so I'll just say I love it too. Mm. I have Christine Feehan's Dark Storm, and I'm a massive Christine Feehan fan, so that one's brilliant. I can't wait. And I have J.R. Ward with Rapture, mm. and it's a Fallen Angels novel. So obviously there's one preceding that one. But yes, so J.R. Ward apparently writes the Black Dagger Brotherhood as well. I've actually, I've heard really good things about that one. Uh, Robin keeps trying to make me read that one. Mm. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll take your word for it. I mean, the covers on these are just beautiful. So I know it's radio and you can't see it, but take my word for it. Luscious. Beautiful. Lush. So yes, that's my reading list for the next few weeks. Hopefully I'll Yay. get through them quicker than I'm getting through my crime novels because <laughs> I'm just not a crime person. Like, I'll give it a go and, uh, and I'll try really hard, but it's, you know, eh. 
<laughs> I'm definitely a paranormal romance kind of person. Me too. Yay! Me too. You know, at least we've got that in common. I'm yep. a little bit worried about the Taramos Assassin book because Taramos is like seriously hardcore with her research. Like she's actually gotten to the point where she will. Oh, what's her most famous one? Where she got a, a police officer or someone to actually choke hold her until she passed out, so she knew how it would feel. Oh, that's that's lovely. So she's hardcore. She knows what she's writing about, and she writes some pretty gory <laughs> stuff, apparently. So I'm like, eh. But then I think, you know what? It can't be worse than the flesh-eating zombies out of that other book that I read earlier on this year. So <laughs> in an eel factor, it's probably not going to be up that high. So I should be okay. okay. <laughs> so I have a question. Okay. Because I want to see if you are anything like me as well. Okay. Do you find that it's scarier to watch something scary, or is it scarier to you to read it? Well, I don't watch a lot of scary because it's scary. Um, I try and avoid reading scary because no matter what they put on the screen, my imagination could probably triple that. So I would probably say reading but then again, I try and avoid both. <laughs> I don't like scary. I like my pink fluffy bunnies. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that was um, that was one of the things that made like the old timey uh, horror horror movies um, work, like it, the old Vincent Price movies. It was the psychological. Exactly. I mean, yeah. if you. Yeah, they didn't show all the blood and the gore. All they showed was someone, like, for example picking up an axe and swinging, and you knew what was about to happen. Or they'd use and shadow or just a sound. Exactly. Yeah. And your yeah. mind had to piece it together. So, And your imagination can come up with worse things that, than they could ever show on screen, and that was what made them so scary, was it just messed with your psyche. Yep. Definitely. Creepy, ew, nasty, black. <laughs> Speaking of creepy, ooh, nasty, Blair, I'm actually tossing up about the name of this show. I'm thinking it's going to be Man Eating Pig. Because this first story has got to be up in, like, the history books of Oh My Godness. <laughs> and you can take it, because I want the second one, no matter what. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. <sighs> I get the one about dead people. Oh, boy! <laughs> oh, now I see why you want the next one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just saw the first word. Uh, uh. <clears throat> All right. Police haven't ruled out criminal activity in Farmer's Mysterious Death from se September 2nd. That's a really long time ago. I know. You're falling behind, dear. <laughs> no, they haven't put as many stuff up in the f weird, freaky, true area. So for those of you wanting to know where Belinda gets her stuff, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> U.S. authorities are investigating how a U.S. farmer was eaten by his hogs. Yeah. <laughs> mm. The district attorney's office says 70-year-old Terry Vance Garner never returned after he set out to feed his animals on Wednesday on his farm near the Oregon coast. A family member later found Garner's dentures and pieces of his body in the hog enclosure, but most of his remains had been consumed. Eh. Mm -hmm. Ew. The district attorney's office said in a statement on Monday that it's possible Garner had a medical emergency such as a heart attack or was knocked over by the animals before he was killed. But criminal activity has not been ruled out. Authorities estimate that hogs weigh 320 kilograms. I don't know what that is, and my phone's over there. <laughs> so it's your turn to do the conversions. <laughs> nah, you guys could do it if you'd really care. They're really big pigs. Just trust me. Yeah, the DA's office says one hog had either bitten or been aggressive with Garner previously. Yeah, hogs are well known for eating anything. just about anything you hand them. Mm-hmm. Including the hand itself. Mm-hmm. Ew. But you know how they always say that everything tastes like chicken? 
I'm wondering mm-hmm. if the farmer tasted like chicken. Oh. I don't know. But, you know, if you are what you eat and, you know, all that type of stuff, would that be, like, really, really gross tasting bacon afterwards? <laughs> I mean, would and it you're smell the same? afraid of watching. <laughs> <laughs> morbid little... Mm. I know, but... You know, that's the way my brain works. That's why it's really, really not a good idea for me to watch horror films and things like that because that just fuels the flames and it's like, mmm, bit of a I worry. can see <laughs> Yeah. Um, next one, there is no segue except for maybe eating things. Mm. <sighs> Chocoholic bees make funny honey. Ah, <laughs> from October 6th. Multicolored honey produced by French bees has been traced to chemical waste from M&M's chocolates. <laughs> now, if you click on the link, yeah. Anyway, beekeepers from Ribeville in Alsace, whatever region of off, northern, off. huh? Off, the off, the off, off, off. That place in France first noticed the problem in August, France TV Info reported. Bees about a dozen apiaries started producing a substance that tasted like honey but was brightly coloured, red, green or blue. André Frey, president of the region's beekeepers, said the coloured honey was unremarkable. How can coloured honey be unremarkable? Oh my god. Unmarketable. Unmarketable. I thought it was... There you go. There's my dyslexia coming in. Fantastic. (laughs) Unmarketable. I reckon that it'd be like... Could you imagine the flavour? Oh, my God. uh, Farmers believe they trace the problem to a nearby biogas plant which turns organic waste and food industry residues into gas fuel. I don't think so. In March, the company had started using sugary waste from the Mars Company factory that produced colourful M&M chocolates and it had been storing the waste in vats open to the air. The company moved the waste into a, uh, into sealed containers indoors, and the bees returned to the flowers of the surrounding fields, which should hopefully fix the honey. However, the beekeepers are still worried by the ongoing effect of the chemicals on their little workers. Okay, um, bees are pretty sensitive, so I'm thinking if they didn't die... The chemicals probably won't do too much. I think they should, like, taste it. They should test it and try and see if they could sell that because that would be actually kind of cool, I think. I'm looking at the picture now. I know. Isn't that awesome? I mean, how many people have put chocolate and honey together anyway? I mean, this is like match made in heaven almost. I know. And, I mean, they reckon that the flavor of honey actually, you know, is changed by which flowers the bees eat or bees Mm -hmm. go to. So unless the chemicals are like really, really inedibly gross, which doesn't make much sense because, you know, it's M&Ms. They're like the, you know, food of the gods. So, you know, what's the problem, dude? Make coloured honey. Could you imagine the kids in the shopping centres? But I don't want blue honey. I want green honey. (laughs) Well, they're all out of green honey. They could make... They could make a killing off of this, though. I mean, they should really look into it. Exactly. And, you know, dude, I'd eat that. (laughs) Sure. Uh Honey would go, like, the prices, or not prices, well, those two, Mm -hmm. but the the sales would go through the roof. It would be phenomenal. Even if they only brought it out at Easter. Easter or, you know, like Christmas, they could do red and greens. Oh, yeah. Halloween, they could try and find a way to make orange. That would be great. Exactly. And then, like, US, US celebrities, instead of asking for, like, the only one color M&M, you could be like, I want M&M, honey. Thank you very much. Or, you know, the, what kills me is it's like a natural thing. If it actually turns out to be pretty good, instead of going through and artificially doing all this crap. You've got a bunch of bees that are doing this and it doesn't seem to be hurting them. Mm. So, yeah. so it's completely natural. Possibly. Completely Poss- safe. Possibly. We hope. I don't know, but yay! 
That would be so cool. Maybe we'll see like a revolution of honey. <laughs> I am still imagining the kid that's chucking a tantrum because they run out of green honey. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as bad as when we had the green and the purple ketchup. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah, we it was fantastic. Because then you'd go into stores and you'd see everyone going, but I don't want the red ketchup, I want the green one. <laughs> or they'd go, I don't want the green one, I want the purple one. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> we only ever changed the outside of our tomato sauce bottles during the Olympics, they were gold. Which cool. I think is wishful thinking, really, because we failed. Um, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of more epic fails. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and we'll have to be careful not to dip into politics after this one, I think. No, I have one thing I want to say after this. Okay. So we're going to dip into politics after this. <laughs> Just for a squidgy bit. I promise it won't be for long. A squidgy bit. <laughs> Just a itty bit. That's my new favorite word now. <laughs> <laughs> How 7-Eleven will predict the U.S. election from October 4th. It's simple. You buy coffee. You choose a blue cup or a red cup. 7-Eleven tallies the results and correctly predicts the U.S. election. It's called 7-Election and it's worked since 2000. Done! Let's back up a little. The blue cup is for the Democrats and the red cup for Republicans. In 2000 and 2004, more red cups were chosen by coffee drinkers and George W. Bush won those elections. In 2008, the groundswell of public opinion swayed towards blue-tinged Java and Barack Obama won the election. With this accurate prognosticating, it stands to reason that 7-Eleven is held up as the benchmark for electoral prediction. So who's going to win in November? The current stock take across the states participating in seven election has Obama getting up 60 to 40. Yay! <laughs> mm -hmm. The news bodes well for Obama as he debates his opponent, Mitt Romney, live on television. While we have never billed seven election as scientific or statistically valid, it is astounding just how accurate the simple count the cups poll has been election after election said 7-Eleven president and CEO Joe, Joe DePinto. <laughs> Pinto bean. <laughs> Sorry. This is not the coffee, Pinto. Yeah. We have had a lot of fun with it, and I hope we have encouraged people how important it is to vote in the real election. We... Yeah. <laughs> Would that be you? No, no, they actually wrote that. <laughs> ah, we need this in Australia. Stat. No, we don't. We know because the opposition runs around in bugly, budgie smugglers and has his wife say, he's not a bad man, he really does like women. <laughs> no, he told women that their place is in the kitchen. He's not getting in. Simple as oh, that. Oh, so he's like Romney. Yeah. Now, speaking of that man, I watched the debate. You poor thing. Well, I was sort of sitting there and I had nothing better to do. I had a migraine headache, so it wasn't going to get any worse. So <laughs> my mum's like, why don't you watch it on a different day? I'm like, that would ruin my day. This day's already crapped out anyway. I might as well just finish it off. So she's like, good point. So I sat there and I watched the debate. Now, public opinion all over Facebook and everywhere else says that Mitt Romney did really well. I don't think so. I don't think so. Mainly on two counts. So I'm basing this whole thing on two things. At the beginning of his speech, he talked about someone who came up to his wife and asked for help. And the words that he apparently said came out of her mouth was, Yes, but. I hate that. That should not come out of any politician's mouth. Yes, but. Because usually the next one and uh, the next bit is you need to help yourself. Now the whole point of politics is to help the little guy, not help the big guy. And by asking someone who is basically trying to help themselves but can't get a leg up because the government's making everything so hard, yeah. you know, by telling them you need to help yourself, it's like really redundant. They're doing the best they can. They're asking for a bit of help. That's that's just my opinion on that one. And secondly, 
He thinks that because PBS requires money, which may be coming from China, he wants to possibly get rid of PBS. PBS, for those of you who don't know or aren't in the States or whatever, runs and produces Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. Now, excuse me, Mr. Romney. I've got the hand going just in case you can't see me because it's radio. Excuse me, Mr. Romney. <laughs> we all grew up with Sesame Street. What is the next generation going to do? Teletubbies? Come on, man. Seriously, this is like the most intelligent program on TV for children. It's mm-hmm. you or know, some it, adults, too. Yeah. It's politically geared. You know, they talk about politics. They talk about stuff like that. They talk about same-sex marriage. They talked about 9-11. You know, they talk about a lot of things. And it puts it in the perspective that children are not scared Mm -hmm. of what's happening around them because they explain it to them in such a way that, you know, it makes sense. Not to mention, I mean... I have a two-year-old, and I have seen some of the cartoons they try to feed children about her age. And half the characters either, and I'm not, I'm, when I say this, I'm not talking about Dora the Explorer. No, you're just gen- um, generalizing across the, across the board. Most know. of them either don't speak English, and again, not talking about Dora the Explorer. I'm talking mm-hmm. about, they don't even speak, or all they say is, rah, 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 rah. Kelly yes. Tubbies, for example. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um... Or they have dumbed it down to the point where even kids are bored. Mm-hmm. Or there's no lesson to it. There's you know, nothing. It's just basically for you to plonk your kid down in front of the TV, watch their brain turn to mush, and then wonder why their speech is impaired. Or exactly. their attention span is that of a gnat. You know? Hello? Sesame Street is a really good thing. It's almost like an investment in children's education. And, you know, it's not even just that. PBS here also has... They don't just do kids' shows. They also do um, concert to raise money, which is how a lot of people have heard about, uh, say, for example, Celtic Women Mm -hmm. or um, Celtic Thunder Mm -hmm. or, you know, different... Things like that. They do um, concerts to raise money. I mean, it's mostly people like calling into these numbers and buying things. Not to mention, they also, it's not just children's ed- education. Here in Louisiana, they do uh, Louisiana history programs, different documentaries. They also do like masterpiece theaters, things like mm-hmm. that. So it it literally kind of spans out to everything. I don't see why cutting funding to PBS could benefit in any way. It's mostly coming out of our pockets. Mm -hmm. So what is it? Public broadcast something or other? The public broadcast system or station or something. Yeah. So, dude, Mitt Romney, please get off your freaking high horse, dude, and don't get rid of Elmo because otherwise Elmo will F you up. Seriously, you will never, ever get into the White House by getting rid of Elmo. Just because that 47% of people that you talked about, they all grew up on Sesame Street. Just mm-hmm. saying. Dude. Okay, 10 tips to spice up your love life, just like they do in the movies. From October 2nd. Ever find yourself sinking into your seat in a darkened cinema, wondering why your love life isn't as exciting as the one on the big screen? No, not generally, because I know I'm married. That's why. Uh, Perhaps it can be. Here are ten tips. Ten relationship tips. Rules. Whatever the fuck it says. Anyway. uh, That we can learn from the movies. The first lesson is from the notebook. I've never seen it. I don't care. Uh, Brave the weather conditions and get close to nature. There's nothing quite like a picnic in the park or a steamy pash in the pouring rain to stimulate the senses. Ow. Number two. Never underestimate the value of a good old-fashioned shopping spree to spoil each other and splash some cash. I agree with this one. Uh, A new wardrobe can be... Uh, can often give a stale relationship fresh legs, <laughs> especially if they're lycra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, remember when Richard Gere and Julia Roberts famously maxed out the credit card on Rodeo Drive in Pretty Woman? Happily ever after, indeed. Yes, because I'm not a prostitute. Hmm. Anyway, uh, be creative with costumes. Whether it's sci-fi superhero or the more daring leather-clad variety, amp up your love life with some themed attire. And the picture that they had there was for Spider-Man. Mind you, though, that particular picture, the guy and Nelly drowned because the rain was going up his nose. Anyway, be bold. You never know if he or she's into... Uh, into until you put yourself out there. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Playing games is so 2010. And the picture for that one is apparently from Girl Next Door. I don't know. I haven't seen the movie, so I'm just taking their word for it. Uh, make sure you've got the right tunes to set the mood. Ryan Gosling's hunky character in Crazy Stupid Love has his dirty dancing routine down to a fine art. What's yours? And I'm trying to do that, but it's radio, so this is not working. Um, <laughs> love cares share during mealtimes. When you and your partner dine out together, opt for dishes that you can share, such as tape, Oh, tapas, tasting plates, or even a dessert at the end, which is where you generally stick dessert, which is at the end. Uh, we all remember Lady in the Trance, adorable kiss over the plate of spag bowl. Oh, I'm not a dog. Anyway, uh, choose a unique location to set the scene. A new location can be particularly beneficial for women. It's about breaking the sexual patterns, says Dr. Godstein. And then the picture was for Titanic. Really? Figure that one out. <laughs> I have a sinking feeling. Didn't they feel. all die? <laughs> <laughs> Most of them did. And, yeah, it didn't end well. That's not really the best picture they could have put there. Anyway, trial some new hobbies together. It doesn't have to get as messy as spinning pottery wheel, although Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore didn't seem to mind. That's because they got paid to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. But go for something out of the box and fun that you can learn together. Uh, number nine, cook up a storm together. Try replacing your date night with a special dinner for two that you have both created Spending time together in the kitchen will also give you a chance to catch up at the end of the long day. And the picture for that was from No Reservations. And number 10, never let the sun go down on an argument. While you might not end up chasing your loved one around the house with a firearm, a la Brad and Angelina in Mr. and Mrs. Smith, settling disputes before you go to bed at night is said to be Relationship 101 and makes for great makeup sex. I wouldn't know. I married... <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. <laughs> <laughs> I applaud you. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> for the record, for the next one, I would like to thank Joanna because this one is kind of, if I'm not mistaken, it's kind of an older story, but it's a goodie. <laughs> I don't know what year it was. I wasn't looking. But anyway. I can't remember. I think it was like... I don't remember. I think it was an older one, but... Oh, this is fantastic. I cried for about ten minutes after I read it. <laughs> How can a walking stick cause the evacuation of an entire city hall? From October 5th. And again, we don't know if that's this year or past year. So, mm -hmm. enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> Akron, former rubber capital of the world and a prime worldwide target for terrorists, located in the state of Ohio, suffered the attack of a walking stick last Wednesday. No, seriously, this is not from The Onion. The stick had the phrases, natural hunk of kaboom, and this is not a weapon, written with a sharpie, a clear sign of mischief. <laughs> Naturally, the police thought the walking stick was a weapon that could go kaboom, because, duh... <laughs> <laughs> so they evacuated City Hall where it was found after all I mean what else can a long walking stick with the word kaboom on it maybe <laughs> obviously it's a typical bomb stupid a typical <laughs> hollow bomb with no cables or detoni detonation mechanism except it was not it was just a walking stick homemade with a shower curtain rod and duct taped on both ends the stick belonged to a man named 
natural hunk of kaboom, a.k.a. <laughs> James Kaboom. <laughs> <laughs> the oh, man dear. says he left his walking stick in the building. According to the chief of police, our, office, our officers did talk to him. They said it was a walking stick. Didn't appear there was any intent to create a panic or any hysteria at the city hall. Thank you, Mr. Kaboom and the Akron City Hall Security Forces for providing this absurd bit of news for all of us to laugh at. <laughs> Very much so. I'm thinking, why did this person's parents not change his last name? Oh, God. I don't know. <laughs> I Kaboom. Mean, how would he be able to fly on aeroplanes? Because wouldn't Excuse like me, sir, are you a terrorist? No. What's your name? Kaboom. What? <laughs> Everybody duck. You know. Oh my god. <laughs> and and you would really hope that nobody would call him out by his last name while on the plane if he finally managed to find his seat. Yeah, that's not going to end well. <laughs> you know. Yeah. 200 kilogram gang member tried to kidnap a boy from October 7th. He looks like a Hollywood special effect. An attempt to turn Al Pacino into Marlon Brando. Yeah, the imagery there is not good. Seriously. Ew. Uh, but Victor Joseph Espinoza is real enough and ac accused of trying to kidnap a 10 year old boy who was on his way to soccer practice. Espinoza, who weighs almost 200 kilograms, so you can do the conversion, yay, was apprehended by police in Santa Ana, California, trying to get over a backyard fence after his alleged attempt, uh, attempted kidnap went wrong. Local TV network KCAL9 wow, uh, reported that Espinoza allegedly approached the boy as the boy and his 19-year-old female cousin were walking to the park. Police came, claim Espinoza lured the boy close enough to grab him by both of his arms and pull him into his body. After a struggle, the boy and his cousin were able to run and alert his soccer coach who tried to tackle and detain Espinoza. Good luck with that. Uh, only to have Espinoza escape. A police helicopter later found Espinoza hiding in a nearby... Holmes' backyard because he couldn't behind couldn't hide behind anything. Uh, Espinoza was held on suspicion of false imprisonment, child annoyance, and other charges. This guy is huge, man. Four hundred and forty pounds. See, and that pig <laughs> was bigger than him. So, oh my god! Yeah, there was no way he could hide. Why? Why would you do that? <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. We have some real jewels on this show today. <laughs> we do. What, did you go looking down, did you? No, I'm talking about what we've talked about so far. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, my God. Okay, so speaking of, well, I guess we'll call it a bright jewel. Mm -hmm. Say that. <laughs> Roscoe painting vandalized at Tate Modern from October 8th. London's Tate Modern was temporarily closed after a mural by U.S. modern artist Mark Roscoe was defaced with black paint. Maybe he was just trying to do what that old woman did. With I don't know, but I'm thinking if they need to repaint it, maybe they should call her in. <laughs> she did a great Please job. Please do. Oh, my God. <laughs> Speaking of, just off to the side before I forget, have you seen that they have actually come up with Halloween costumes for that? Oh, have they? Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to be this year? I'm going to be that dumbass painting overseas. <laughs> my God. It was brilliant. Oh, my God. I'll have to find the picture. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, let's see, okay. The gallery shut for a short time on Sunday afternoon after the damage was found on the corner of one of the Rothko Seagram murals. Tate can confirm that there was an incident in which a visitor defaced one of Rothko Seagram murals by applying a small area of black paint with a brush to the painting, said the spokeswoman for the gallery. The Seagram murals, commissioned by New York's Four Seasons restaurant in 
1958 arrived in London for display at Tate Modern Sister Gallery on February 25, 1970, the day the artist committed suicide, age 66. A large-scale painting by the artist fetched U.S. 86.9 million, or 85.2 million, in Australian dollars, at a New York auction in May, setting a new record for the com contemporary work of art. The Russian-born expressionist painter became a giant of the modern art world through his simplified and colorful compositions inspired by mythology and primitive art. Okay, so I like the fact that it starts off talking about the defacing and then just kind of throws that topic out the window. Like, oh yeah, this is actually boring. Talk mm -hmm. about something else. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm going to miss the next one and I'm going to go into the most bizarre one that I've read for a while. Government chases a father over a one cent debt from October 7th. A Calandra father of three feels guilty that taxpayers' money has been wasted by the federal government in a 10-month quest to chase up an outstanding debt he has of just one cent. Keep in mind, one cent coins went out, like, pfft, God, over two decades ago. At least it feels like it. Um, Not for us. Oren Dilbaz went to Calandra Post Office in November last year to settle a child support agency invoice of really big numbers. Uh, $1,954.21. Yeah, 4954 dollars and 21 cents. He paid with cash, so the amount was rounded down by one cent, and he only paid $4,954.20. Since then, however, he has received nine monthly letters asking that he clear that remaining unpaid debt. The cost of postage alone, even with the government bulk mail discounts, would easily cover the tiny debt many times over. When I received the first letter, it said I owed that one cent. I called them straight away. The lady told me, it's a computer-generated thing, don't worry about it. Uh, but now I have nine letters. Someone has to worry. Mr. Dilbaz said he was prepared to pay the $1 to the agency to clear the remaining debt and stop the letters. They should have stopped them in the first place when I called them, he said. It's put me in a situation that I feel guilty now. However, after being contacted by the Daily Child Support Agency yesterday, uh, said it would stop the letters. Blah, blah, blah. We apologize. Blah, blah, blah. One cent. Ha! Okay. <laughs> oh my god one cent we don't even have one cent coins circulating anymore How we do good luck so what are they like pennies mm -hmm. there you go huh, I know something uh, I, I don't know whether it's this one or the next one but thanks mum it's this one mm-hmm because she handed it to me as well. And when I opened it, I went, another one? Really? What is it with you people and shoving things in your rectum? Really? <laughs> yeah, we're great at that. Oh, my God. Ah, I think it's like an Australian fetish or something. Like, everyone in Australia has this fetish or something. I think so. So you do as well? <laughs> No, I don't personally, <laughs> but I do think it is a problem. You heard it here first, people. <laughs> yes, I'm not crazy. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Two years of evidence to the contrary. <laughs> 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 All right, so, <laughs> are you ready, people? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sex toy retrieval drama for man from October 1st. Again, thank you, Belinda's mom. Yay. <laughs> Again. A Maruchidor man was forced to call the Queensland Ambulance Service for assistance after he was unable to remove a sex toy lodged in his backside. Yes, you did, in fact, hear all of that correctly. Hope you're having a great <laughs> breakfast, by the way. Yeah. Tasty. <laughs> the sure to be embarrassing. Hopefully, it wasn't chocolate pudding. The sure to be embarrassing phone call for help was made about eight thirty a.m. I'm sorry, but I would have called every friend that I know <laughs> before I ever called the ambulance. 
Mm, no, they'd probably grab it on like their iPhone and stick it on YouTube. Nah. That is true. I, I do know my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Paramedics arrived soon after and took the man to the Nambor. Nambor! Yay! You got it. Yay! General Hospital for Treatment. He was quite distraught. I can imagine. <laughs> It followed a recent spate of similar and bizarre incidents around Australia and abroad. Late last month, a man presented to the emergency room department... Or, excuse me, <laughs> I mixed it with American and Australian. There we go. Emergency department at the Auckland City Hospital with an eel stuck up his rectum. We read that one. Yep. <laughs> a slippery intru- or The slippery intruder was confirmed by an x-ray and scan. A month earlier, a man in the Northern Territory thought he would be a bit cheeky. Uh (laughs) with a party trick that involved setting off firecrackers between his buttocks. We read that one. (laughs) (laughs) It left the 23-year-old man with bad burns to his cheeks, back, and genitals. Well, it said that he didn't get his genitals when he was saying it, so yeah, anyway. (laughs) Ha (laughs) ha. He lied. And this one concerns me the most. Yesterday, a Brisbane newspaper reported Queensland teenagers were risking their lives with the strange butt-chugging practice involving pouring alcohol into a rubber tube placed in the rectum. It claimed ingesting alcohol this way was to speed up the intoxication process. That is true, but that doesn't mean you should do it. Ew. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And we're going to stay along the same lines. Ha ha, man caught packing backside booty. From the same website. (laughs) Actually, right underneath the other one. Uh, A drug offender packed two goodie bags for his prison trip containing 39 tablets, a needle and syringe and cannabis and hid them in his bum. (laughs) That's not the funny bit. The guy's name is Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. The king lives. Anyway, the drug offender, not the late pop star, appeared in the Toowoomba Magistrates Court and pleaded guilty to three counts of possessing dangerous drugs and possessing a syringe. Prosecutor Sergeant Tony Costa said Jackson was arrested at Chinchilla on a return to prison warrant at the weekend. He was searched and placed in a clean cell at the Toowoomba Police Watch House on Sunday morning. You mean they have dirty ones? That's not good. Uh, Staff entered his cell at 7.10am and discovered two tightly wrapped packages in Jackson's bedding. (laughs) I don't know whether I want to keep reading now. Uh, Sergeant Costa said Jackson, 28, told police the packages had been smuggled into his cell up my, I'll say, clacker. I'll say clacker because that's not going to get beeped. Anyway, defence soldier Dan Haberman said Jackson had been on the run for three weeks after breaching his parole and knew he was going back to prison. Blah, 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 blah. He shoved it up his bum and yay! No, hang on. I've got to read this part. Haberman said Jackson had packed away some of his belongings. Do the cops go, you ready to go? He goes, yep, all packed. And he's got nothing in his hands. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> 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 oh, it's just wrong on so many levels. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Good now. <laughs> We're at the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <sighs> okay, we'll see you all next week. Hope you have a really lovely birthday, Jackie. And yep, Thank you. see you, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Play, damn it. <laughs> and this has been the Friday Catch Up, powered by the Paraquest Radio Network. Remember to catch The Hostess with No Ghostess every Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the ParaQuest Radio Network.